Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around I've got three movies sent to me by Umbrella Entertainment. All three are horror films. Two of them are Korean horror films directed by Kim Ji Woon. And they are very different, but mind-blowing each in their own way. And the third is an Australian horror film which has been considered one of the worst Australian movies of all time. And it is a movie which was financed by Discotech. So let's get started with the other two first. I'm going to start with 2003's A Tale of Two Sisters, which is a great horror film. With these first two movies, go in as cold as you can. I'm going to tell you a bit about them, but I'm only going to tell you enough to make it a bit of a tease so that you're sucked in. A Tale of Two Sisters from 2003 is based on a Joseon Dynasty era folk tale which is really interesting. There's a Wikipedia page about it, and you can find a link from A Tale of Two Sisters telling the original folktale. And it, the movie varies from that a lot. It's set in the modern era, and, and so there are aspects of the original folktale they couldn't put into this one. But the adaptation does really well, and there are some really wonderful twists and turns in this one. The story is based around a, a young girl called Sumi, who is returning from hospital. She's had a breakdown and she's been in hospital for a while. So her father, her stepmother and her sister, Suyon, are there when she arrives back at the country house where the family live. But things are very weird. The father is quite distant and at times snaps at her. The stepmother is very dismissive of a lot of the things she says. And she is very protective of her younger sister who is being harassed by their stepmother. Not in a sexual way, but in general being treated very poorly. The sisters go down to a lake and bond there. An aunt and uncle come around for dinner and things go very weird at that stage. And it becomes fairly obvious fairly soon that some of the characters aren't acting right and that the house may well be haunted. The stepmother was actually the nurse for the children's mother when she became ill for cancer and she fell in love with the father and they married so there's a attention to the dynamic there as well things are what you think they are there are some twists and turns and complications and elaborations in this movie that came a bit unexpectedly to me i was just going along trying to understand what was going on and the twists in the plot blindsided me and i love that i love movies that trick me i wasn't particularly looking for any tricks in this one it starts out at a, at a slow and measured pace but everything you see on screen has a purpose and a reason for being there in the plotting of the the story that unfolds. Oh, One of the great things the director Kim Ji Woon does is there are some scare effects which are done in camera very subtly and I love the way he does it, particularly when the stepmother is looking underneath a kitchen bench because she's been told by somebody that there's a young girl hiding in a cupboard un in the kitchen. So there's, there's a really nice reveal of that. There are some also practical effects. There are times when the camera rotates around the characters and that indicates that something's going on. It's a beautifully shot film. It's shot in the Korean countryside. The country house is both interesting and spooky. And the acting is terrifically on point. Now, the disc I've got, I don't have the deluxe edition of this one. But this one comes with a beautiful painting for the cover. And the painting on the back is just as good. It's, uh, there are 1,250 of these. This is number 37 of 1,250. You get a J card, which has all the details on the back of the extras. And you get a reversible cover. There's that one, which shows the sisters sitting with a father and stepmother there's also a version of it that doesn't have the australian uh censorship rating on it the extras are pretty good as well you've got an audio commentary with the writer director kim ji Woon, cinematographer lee mogai who's also the cinematographer in the second film we're going to talk about and lighting director oh sung chung there's an audio commentary uh, with the cast members as well and the director new audio commentary by author and film historian dr colette balmain making of feature at interviews with the cast to lead us scene there's a music score feature which is pretty good as well and the director's thoughts on horror feature see the movie with the psychiatrist feature 
Uh, there are letters, a letter from Sumi to Su Yon, and letters from Su Yon to Su Mi in there as well. So there's a lot of extras in this one. This movie stays with you. It's a haunting movie. And there is a supernatural aspect to it, but there's also a non-supernatural aspect to it, which I know is a vague thing to say, but, but it's true in this case. This is a great release, and I want to see more things like this from Umbrella. K-horror is a very broad genre. You get K-horror comedies, you get really dark K-horror movies. But for the most part, but a lot of them are based on these folk legends from Korea, about which particularly Anglophone audiences know very, very little, if anything. And that's great because we kind of think we know what's happening in the movie, and then there are some twists and turns and some tilts and some kind of reframing of reality that goes on and it delights and surprises me and I, I love being surprised by movies when they do it in a good way that can, that can be determined and, and interpreted as being consistent with the rest of the movie Kevin Thomas in the Los Angeles Times I like this one a triumph of stylish dark absurdist horror that even manages to strike a chord of Shakespearean tragedy and I'll go along with that this is one of the few horror movies I've seen lately that, that's profoundly sad the resolution to the plot is profoundly sad and tragic and it really hit me and I was a bit surprised by that. So the two sisters played by Lim Soo Young and Moon Kyung Young are really good in the role that they feel like they're sisters and they have that kind of sibling affinity that works really well. And the father played by Kim Kap Su does some very low-key good work as well. The stepmother played by Yong Jing Ah is great too. She has to play her role in several different ways during the movie. And that differentiation is something she does really well with it as well. This one was totally not on my radar. In fact, both of the Korean films I'm going to talk about weren't on my radar. But I'm glad they are now, and I'm glad I've watched them. So that then takes us to a much more brutal horror movie. It's a serial killer horror movie called I Saw the Devil, which is really really hardcore you know, don't watch this one with children don't watch this one with people of a delicate sensibility again I, I knew nothing about it apart from the fact that it was a serial killer movie but it's got something really really dark in it and it goes in a direction that i'm going to spoil slightly but i'm not going to spoil all of because i think the the real punch lies in the ending there's a serial killer called uh kyung chul played by Choi min sik who was the guy who got locked up for 15 years in old boy who is a dangerous psychopath he kills for pleasure he's a school bus driver in his disguise life and he finds a woman at the side of the road the car's broken down she's waiting for a tow and it's snowing it's winter time and he offers her a lift and then he goes berserk he kidnaps her takes her back to his lair and he brutalizes and kills her what he doesn't know is that her fiance played by lee byung horn is a secret agent with the nis in south korea and he's got a special set of skills his name's kim soo hyun and he decides he's going to track down and find a serial killer he gets some information from some friends who work it and gets some printouts from them he also gets a capsule which has both a microphone and a tracking device in it a little thing like that and so he, he finds some people who are potential serial killers he kidnaps and tortures two of them to get information finds out that they weren't involved in the murder of his fiance and then he finds Kung Chul and things go in a weird direction he puts the capsule inside the man and lets him go and we get a really really dark path that this security agent goes down with this one and we meet a whole bunch of other characters there is a cannibal friend of the serial killers and the serial killer takes sanctuary with him at one stage and that guy is an incredibly sick puppy there's graphic violence in this there's lots of prosthetic effects that are quite brutal it's not the kind of movie that america wouldn't make because they wouldn't go this hardcore brutal on this particular subject ever even things like Seven Day go as far as this movie does. And it ends on a note that really shocked me and surprised me, but it was the right note for this movie. And they've got a quote by Friedrich Nietzsche on the back. He who fights with monsters should look into it, that he himself does not become a monster. When you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. And this is the abyss gazing deeply into this guy. Again, it's a beautifully shot film. It, it looks fantastic. It 
misleads us in some ways and then takes things down a, a very different path in the best possible way. There's two versions of this movie on the disc. There's the international version and there is the 144 minute Korean version, which has a bit more clarity in it. Uh, there's a new audio commentary by author and filmmaker Kat Ellinger. And Kat Ellinger is always good value. I haven't listened to this one, but I will go back and do the commentary track because I like what Kat Ellinger does really well with these movies and the way she recontextualizes it in a way that I haven't thought of. There's a making of featurette, interviews with the cast and crew, deleted scenes, raw and rough behind the scenes of I Saw the Devil featurette, and a trailer. This one, of course, has the J card on it, so there's your J card. I really love this cover art on the slipcover. I think that's really beautifully done. And it works really well. And there's a slipcover art on the back of the car of the fiancé in the snow. Two choices on the inside cover for the disc. I actually prefer this one. I like this one a lot. But I saw The Devil and Tale of Two Sisters blew my mind away. Because you get this conceit if you've watched a lot of movies that you know where a movie's going in rough terms. And both of these movies didn't go where I expected them to because they came from a different storytelling tradition, a different cultural background. And I love that. I love the fact that I can't predict these things. I'm not Basil Rathbone when it comes to working out who the murderer is, for instance, or where the plot's going. Both of those movies blew me away in the best possible way. And movies like that re-energise me about the kinds of movies I watch. There's a cinema out there that is totally new to me, or at least mostly new to me, that gives such good value for the time spent watching the cinema. We're going from the sublime to the ridiculous now with the Australian cult film, House Boat Horror. 1989 slasher film directed by two people, Kendall Flanagan and Ollie Martin, written and produced by Ollie Martin, with music by Brian Maddox, who was in a band called, I think, The Uncanny X-Men. It was edited by Clayton Jacobson, who's a really interesting guy. He made a film with his brother, Shane, called Kenny, which is an Australian comedy classic. And he also developed, before anybody in America was, the virtual backdrops that we have in cinema now. You know, The Mandalorian had all those virtual backdrops. Clayton Jacobson was working on that five years before anybody else. Really interesting guy. So there's your wonderful cover of it. And this is the deluxe edition, so I've got a few bells and whistles on this one. I love the, the kind of pretension of this booklet I got with it. Houseboat Horror, an undiscovered masterpiece of cinema. Now this was kind of thought of lost, and uh, they thought that the master was lost. Until Ollie Martin's personal archive came up. Ollie Martin died in 2020, and he, his personal archive came up with a Type-C one-inch videotape of this movie. It was transferred from the tape source to digital, retimed from 25 frames per second to 24, upscaled from 720 by 580 to 1920 by 1080, and finally processed to create a high-definition master with increased image detail, clarity, and color. So they did a lot of work on this one. And there's all sorts of um, little bits and pieces about this movie, including newspaper clippings in the booklet. Neighbours star in Sex Romp, an uh, article about Melbourne shot on video underground in the 1980s, which it covers other movies, including Bloodlust. Made in Australia, made for video. There's a ton of stuff in this. And there are also, and I've got to check these cards out, there are also some uh, interesting cards for this film. That's the kind of movie it is. There's some horror on the houseboat. Won't show you that one too gory. Won't show you that one too gory. Um, YouTube is a little bit vapory about these things. There's Acid Face, the bad guy. So we've got all of that. Then we get to the actual um, slipcover. I haven't even got to the slipcover yet. I think Umbrella's doing a new brand called Uncovered Masterpieces of Cinema, which is up at the top there. But there's your slipcover. Vacation at Lake Infinity. Beautiful place to die. And here is the inside cover based on the original VHS cover and we get a poster as well because we all love posters. It's a double-sided poster with that one and that one on it. There's your alternative cover as well. So what is the movie about? So this movie was made by the people who own the Underground Nightclub in Melbourne which is one of the big venues. Everybody is anybody turned up at the Underground. They decided to make a slasher film and make some bucks out of it. They filmed for 14 days on Lake Eildon east of Melbourne. 
which is not really a lake, it's a dam for Melbourne's water supply and for hydroelectric power. And it has houseboats on it. Um, never much liked Lake Eland, it wasn't my kind of place, but I've been there a few times. A film crew go out to Lake Infinity, as it's called, and they're going to do a music video for a band that's really not very good at all. And so they get three houseboats for hire, take them out to the far reaches of Lake Infinity and start filming the music video. Some people are sleeping together, some people are just there to get drunk and stoned, and they do a bit of work on the side as well. Meanwhile, a serial killer who lives with his sister on a farm, and his sister's played by Louise Severson, who does the best acting in this film. This is at the start of her career, and she actually gives her A game to this movie, which, to be fair, doesn't deserve it. The director is played by Alan Dale, who started out on Neighbours. He was a New Zealand DJ, came to Australia, started out in the TV series Neighbours, about which I know very little because I've never seen it. And then he went to America, where he got character roles playing US senators and, and businessmen and things like that, and he lives there to this day doing that kind of a gig. Now, most of the people who made this movie and appeared in it or worked on it didn't get paid because the people running the nightclub were a bunch of shonks. So this got all the stuff that you want in a 1980s slasher film. It's got slashing. And in fact, one of the weak spots for Acid Face, the, the murderer, is that he uses a whole bunch of different weapons. He doesn't have a single weapon. He uses Gurkha cookery knife. He uses kitchen knives. He uses axes. He uses a horseshoe. He just uses whatever's available to kill people. And I kind of like my slash a movie murderers to have a signature weapon. I don't care what it is. It could be a morning star. It could be a battle axe. I just want them to have a decent weapon. Like Freddy Krueger has his glove. But this guy doesn't. He's all over the place. Now, the uh, gore special effects are pretty good. The makeup effects on Acid Face are pretty good. But the movie that has lots of problems with things like lighting. The lighting is not very good. I bought the houseboats and the direction um Oli martin the the guy who produced it and rewrote it worked for about three days directing it and then the people back at um the underground nightclub said to him no no we're going to get someone else in so they got in kendall kendall flanagan who'd done a whole bunch of tv episodes of various things and he did the rest of the film i'll give you a little peek at the, the gore effects there not too much of it but just a little peek there so the movie isn't great. Uh, I'll be honest with you. It's, it was shot on video. It wasn't done very well. Some of the acting is pretty dodgy. You get a, a cameo by John Michael Housen, which is a little bit funny and a little bit odd at the same time. But the value added on this is the commentary track by comedian Tony Martin and a film historian called Jared Gahan. Tony Martin reviews this movie on ABC television on a comedy show he had called The Late Show where he was one of the people on The Late Show along with an ensemble of comedians and it was shot live and so he actually reviewed Houseboat Horror in 1992 live on television and the videotape of that's on here and he does a great commentary track talking about the making of the film along with uh, Jared Gahan who has researched this movie in incredible detail you got the um, 30th anniversary Monster Fest Q&A with Clayton Jacobson, Brian Maddox, Don Bridges, Stephen Whitaker, Craig Alexander, Christopher Young, Warren Amster and Boyd Martin, who were all involved in the movie. My interview with Gavin Wood, who was a DJ in um, Australia and did voiceover work on television, and he turns up in this movie as well, basically standing on top of a boat yelling DJ slogans and yelling at people for a little bit. It's an odd little cameo, but it kind of works in context. And he gets some of the best lines in the movie, which were ad-libbed. There's an interview with actor Zlatko Kazmovic, uh, who played Acid Head. An interview with actor Craig Alexander. An interview with actress Louise Severson. Uh, an interview with Elisa Meadows, another actress. A whole bunch of interviews with other people, including Clayton Jacobson. Uh, Fatal Visions, an interview with film journalist Michael Helms, who produced horror film magazines here in Australia for a long time, and fanzines. It's got the Late Show version, a short film directed by Zlatko called uh, Killer Zombies. There's a feature documentary called The Mad Dead Devils Down Under, which was about Australian stuntmen that Ollie Martin directed back in the day. And there's a digital remaster comparison feature as well. So there's a ton of stuff in this. And it's a 350 
a copy um, limited edition, which is kind of cool as well. But this is an odd one. Um, the movie itself is is pretty poor, but it's poor in a way that you can appreciate. And you can watch it with Tony Martin's um, commentary track on and enjoy it a lot more, where he and Jared Gahan talk about the movie and, and have a great time with it as well. But it's the extras that make this work, and it's also documenting a time in Australian filmmaking when director video movies were made for the um, VHS market and pumped out as quickly as they could, sometimes by shocky people who didn't know what they were doing. So it's a kind of love letter to that, and and I like the fact that Umbrella did it. They took a movie that wasn't very good, they had it tarted up, they got all the right people in, they added a ton of really interesting extras, and they made it work, and that's what this is. If you're the kind of person who likes B-grade horror movies, if you're a Frank Hennon lighter kind of guy, for instance, you're going to enjoy getting this one, because it took me back to my prowling around Melbourne looking for VHS copies of things and, and times when I paid enormous amounts for very dodgy VHS copies of things but uh, Houseboat Horror you should get that one some people could look at it as polishing a turn I don't think it is I think it's polishing a kind of honest effort that a lot of people put a lot of work into this movie and didn't get paid for it so 30 years later it comes out with something that honours their work as much as anything else I think it's well worthwhile. And thanks to Umbrella for not only producing that, but giving me a copy to enjoy and to keep. So that's it for this time around. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, hit the notification bell. Got Science Fiction Saturday coming up at the end of the week. And I may go very retro with this one. I think I can find some things on the shelves that will fulfill that particular criteria. And I'm going to enjoy doing it. Until then, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies, and I'll catch you next time.